It was that same yearning for freedom that nearly 250 years ago gave birth to a special place called America. It was a small cluster of colonies caught between a great ocean and a vast wilderness. It was home to an incredible people with a revolutionary idea that they could rule themselves, that they could chart their own destiny, and that together they could light up the entire world. Hello, friends. Father Frank Pavone here, director of Priests for Life. Welcome to Praying for America. It's so good to have you with us uh, again this evening. And, uh, you know, the last two evenings we uh, had uh, conversations with our executive director, Janet Morana. And tonight I want to continue building on those conversations, continue to explore with you the document that was leaked from the Supreme Court the verified, authentic uh, draft opinion that Justice Alito wrote in this Dobbs case dealing with Roe v. Wade and abortion. Before we go into the continued analysis of that document, let's turn to Scripture, as we always do. And I'd like to read from um, Psalm 59. It says, Rescue me, O God, from my enemies, from my adversaries. Defend me. Rescue me from evildoers, from bloodthirsty men, save me. For behold, they lie in wait for my life. Mighty men come together against me. Not for any offense or sin of mine, O Lord, for no guilt of mine, they hurry to take up arms. Rouse yourself to see it and aid me. For you are the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Arise, punish all the nations, have no pity on any worthless traitors. Let us pray. Lord, you are the God of pity and compassion, and we ask you to show that compassion to us, to our families, to our nation, as we continue to labor under the culture of death. But Lord, as we see light on the horizon, as we see hope in the air, as we see you in our midst, bringing about victories for life. We pray, Lord, in these days for the Supreme Court as so many of our fellow citizens are turning their attention to this landmark case that is now being finalized. Lord, this can be a major turning point for our country in abandoning this culture of violence and in abandoning the activism of the courts that takes away the right of the people to pass their own laws. Lord, give us this this new chapter in our nation's life, where we will choose life, where we will take responsibility for lawmaking, and where we will limit the power of the courts. Take us, O God, beyond where we are. Bring us victory over our enemies, enemies of freedom, enemies of life, enemies of you, O God. And let us live as one nation under you, O God, with liberty and justice, not just for some, but for all, born and unborn. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, that's what this case is really all about. And you know, when we say, and I love this hat, I know many of you have these hats, Make America Great Again. When we say Make America Great Again, we're talking about the principles that make her great, And these are principles from the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These these are principles like you protect life. It's so basic and uh, it's big because if we don't stick to the principle that life always has to be protected, human life is sacred, innocent life may never be taken, the state may never authorize it. That's core to our form of government. If you abandon that, if you change that, like the court changed in Roe v. Wade. Well, you're essentially changing the, the type of government that you have, and you're making it into a tyrant state. Well, I want to continue analyzing this opinion. Now, Janet and I spoke about the whole first section of the opinion, this draft opinion by Justice Alito, which, of course, the justices are 
editing the wording of it, but I don't think they're going to change their judgment that Roe v. Wade, as we've chanted in the pro-life movement for decades, Roe v. Wade has got to go because it's unconstitutional, it's damaging, it's harmful. And that was the first part of this document that Janet and I discussed in the last two episodes. Justice Alito raises and answers the question, does the Constitution confer a right to an abortion? And looking at the text and looking at the history and looking at the way in which the court uh, determines precedent and determines unenumerated rights in the Constitution, he concluded no to that question. No, the Constitution does not confer a right to an abortion. He says any policy on this matter should be left to the states. Then in the second part of the document, which I want to look at now, he goes into this question of whether the court needs to uh, always observe what's called stare decisis, two Latin words, as we mentioned last time, that mean basically, well, you stand by the things that have already been decided. You kind of treat the same topic the same way the court has treated it in the past. And his answer is, well, yes and no. Stare decisis is a very important principle for maintaining a continuity in the development of law and of of jurisprudence. It's uh, very uh, important for the the predictability of how a court is going to handle a particular matter. And then that helps the lawmakers as they make law. But it's not, as he says here in the opinion, an inexorable command. And that's quoting from a 2009 Supreme Court decision that said this stare decisis is not like a straitjacket. It's not like, oh, well, you know, we can't move. You know, we decided on this way in the the past. We can't change that. Well, yes, you can. If the Supreme Court ruled a certain way in the past, and we went over some of these examples last time, it can change that message, that ruling on the same topic today in the light of either changed circumstances or a changed awareness that, you know what, we made a mistake. Okay. Justice Alito makes another point that this stare decisis, this idea that you have to abide by your past decisions, and help me, let me help you understand what I'm about to say, what he says here. Quoting again a previous Supreme Court decision, um, it's at its weakest, the stare decisis principle is at its weakest point when we interpret the Constitution. So courts settle cases and controversies, right? And they'll they'll apply the law to a particular controversy and say one side is, you know, the winner and the other side is the loser, or they'll, they'll, they'll apply the Constitution to a particular case. But, 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 but certain cases have to deal with the very interpretation of the Constitution itself. Now, why is that the weakest point at which one might say they have to abide by past decisions? Because what if the past decision was, was erroneous? The only way for the people, because the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, the only way that the people and all people in the country have to abide by the federal Constitution, each state has its own Constitution, but we all in these United States have to abide by the federal Constitution. How do you fix a mistake? If you made a mistake in interpreting the Constitution a year ago, five years ago, 50 years ago, How do the people get out from under the harmful effects of that mistake? That the only, uh, unless the court corrects itself, the only other way to do it is to amend the Constitution. But the founders made, purposely made that very hard to do. You've got to get a lot of consensus among the American people to amend the Constitution, reflected in a two thirds majority of their elected representatives in the House and the Senate. And then ratification by three quarters of the states. Not easy to do. So this is why uh, uh, the the justices are saying, not just in this draft opinion, but in, 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 in previous decisions, that, you know what, we've really got to uh, be ready to make these corrections in the interpretation of the Constitution. And then he goes into more detail about reversals of Supreme Court cases in the past. We talked about that 
in the last uh, discussion. So let me move then past that. And he goes then into a consideration of five different factors that would um, strongly favor reversing Roe and Casey. Now, Casey, remember, was the reaffirmation of Roe, although I would say very weak reaffirmation, as we also discussed last time, in 1992. So Roe was in 1973, Casey was in 1992. In both cases, you ended up with this so-called constitutional right to abortion. But, but Justice Alito and the opinion of the court here, again, draft opinion, unofficial, said, uh, look, there's five different factors to consider that would suggest it's time to reverse both Roe and Casey. And let me tell you what those five things are. The nature of the error, first of all, the uh, quality or lack thereof of the reasoning, okay, both in Roe and in Casey, the workability of the rules that they imposed on the country in uh, dealing with the question of abortion, the fourth thing, the disruptive effect that these rulings have in other areas of the law. And finally, the question of reliance, the absence of concrete reliance on these decisions. Let me go through uh, each of uh, these points. The nature of the court's error. This is not simply a small matter. This is a matter of life and death. This is a matter of deeply, passionately held values and beliefs that go to the core of people's moral compass, to the core of their family life, to the core of their personal uh, lives, to the core of their religious faith. Um, and the court made a grievous error here in, first of all, taking this very, very contentious issue of life and death out of the hands of the people and their elected representatives and just imposing a solution on the nation. The nature of the error led to 63 and a half million abortions with untold damage from the deaths of those children on the moms, the dads, the other relatives, the grandparents, the siblings, damage that we're still only beginning to understand. Furthermore, the Casey decision had the arrogance of saying to the nation, listen, the contending sides on this issue ought to put aside their uh, contention and accept the mandate of the court. It's like, what? Since when does the court have the role of ending a national controversy on a very a topic that is of such moral significance and importance to so many people. That's not the role of the court. Uh, and, and, and this was a tremendously damaging mistake. So no small error, in other words. So point number one, because the error was so grievous and has so many damaging consequences, that by itself is a strong reason to overrule. Then Justice Alito goes on to a second reason, and he said, look, when you examine Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992, and you examine Roe v. Wade from 1973, the reasoning in these decisions is unusually weak. Now, as we've already reviewed, and as he goes into in depth, there is no right to abortion either in the text of the Constitution the history of our country and the way we've interpreted the Constitution, or in precedent, that is, previous decisions of the court. Up until 1973 with Roe v. Wade, there was no recognition of this. Okay, so to reason that it exists now, that it suddenly appeared out of thin air, is a very, very weak um, argument. Let's go into a little bit more uh, detail. When the Casey decision came along in 1992, a lot of people thought that that was going to reverse Roe v. Wade. Ended up that that didn't happen. But when you look at the Casey decision, it sort of, it seemed as though 
The justices were embarrassed by Roe v. Wade. Why do I say that? Why does Justice Alito say this in other words? Because they refrained from endorsing most of its reasoning. For example, Roe v. Wade had an erroneous historical narrative. It was just, it was just erroneous. They were erroneous about uh, how abortion was treated early on in our history. They were erroneous about the reasons why the state started codifying laws against abortion in the mid-19th century. Um, they were, it was just erroneous. So the Casey decision did not repeat the historical arguments in Roe v. Wade. Furthermore, Roe v. Wade set out a trimester framework in its answer to the question of whether the Constitution gives a right to abortion. What they said was they divided the nine months of pregnancy into three three-month periods called trimesters, right? And so they said, look, in the first trimester, the state may not interfere at all in the abortion decision. It's got to be between a woman and her doctor. In the second trimester, the interest of the state in protecting the health of the woman becomes compelling. So what that means is, as long as the state is reserved and uses the least restrictive means, uh, it can regulate abortion for the sake of the health of the mother. Not prohibit it, but regulate it. For example, okay, it has to be done in a hospital rather than just in a clinic, etc., Second trimester. And then in the third trimester, the interest of the state in protecting the life inside the mother becomes compelling. And therefore, the state could even prohibit abortion, but not if it's needed for the life or health of the mother. And the court interpreted life and health so broadly. Uh, you know, I'm emotionally upset. I'm too young. Uh, family considerations that it becomes the exception that swallows the rule. OK, but here's the here's the weakness of this whole system of rules and regulations that they laid out, this trimester framework. First of all, Casey abandoned it. The Casey decision got rid of all those distinctions in that trimester framework. They threw it out the window. So they kind of left Roe in tatters. You know, they, 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 they upheld it, but they radically changed it. And it's good that they rejected the trimester framework because, again, that pointed to the weakness of the argument in the first place because it's like, where did this trimester framework come from? Did this come from the Constitution? I thought the court was simply supposed to be applying existing law and applying the Constitution to the law, not writing new law, creating new policy. They drew these boundary lines, okay, but they didn't explain why they drew the boundary lines where they drew them. They just asserted, okay, just like, you know, a king sitting on his throne saying, well, I'm just going to dictate whatever I want the people to do. I mean, this is literally what it's like, sitting on their throne and saying, oh, well, at the end of the first trimester, that's when the state's interest in the health of the mother becomes compelling. Really? So give me the reason why it's not compelling before that. At the end of the second trimester, the state's interest in protecting the life in the womb becomes compelling. And then they are able... See, this is where, again, where this is roughly the line of what viability was at that point in 1973. And we're going to come back to the question of viability again. But then they, they said, oh, well, that's the point at which it becomes compelling that the state could protect the baby. Oh, really? Well, if the state has an interest in protecting the baby, why is it compelling at the end of the second trimester and not in the middle of the second trimester? They give no rationale. They draw these lines, which is the work, by the way, that legislatures are supposed to do. If we had seen this trimester framework, for example, coming out of the law in Texas that Roe v. Wade was challenging. Well, then we could say, okay, well, the court looked at the, the, the framework that the legislators had drafted when they would have had to give their reasons. And the court could have said, well, we see nothing here that is conflicting with the Constitution. But that's not what they did. They drew the lines themselves. 
They created the structure themselves. It's like, wait a second, what are you guys doing? That's the that's the work of of, of uh, legislators. And again, they don't explain why they drew the lines in those places and don't deduce it from any kind of constitutional source. Now, Roe v. Wade went through, as we mentioned already, a very uh, lengthy but faulty version of history, Okay, relying on one pro-abortion historian, not even really an historian, and he was a lawyer. And um, they talk about irrelevant things. They talk about the views and the practices of ancient civilizations that widely accepted even the killing of born babies. So they discuss the ancient Greek and Roman practices in Roe versus Wade. It's like, okay, that's all very interesting. You know, if I have nothing better to do one evening and I want to read about the ancient Greek and Roman practices of infanticide. But when it comes to the most historically relevant facts, namely, how were the states dealing with abortion at the time of the adoption of the 14th Amendment? And that's relevant because the other side is making the constitutional argument that the right to abortion somehow flows from the 14th Amendment. Roe v. Wade said almost nothing. Nothing. Zero. Oh, let's talk about the ancient Greeks and Romans, but never mind what the United States of America was actually thinking at the time of the 14th Amendment. This is... There are some words that describe this, brothers and sisters, but basically this is garbage. I mean, this 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 thing just deserves to be burned and the ashes, you know, sort of scattered in the forest. It's garbage. Um, okay. Then it starts talking about privacy. Well, now privacy is not in the Constitution, just like abortion isn't. But what Roe v. Wade mistakenly did was to combine or conflate two very different meanings of the word privacy. Because you can think of privacy as, oh, I can't reveal certain information. And you can also consider privacy from the vantage point of the government cannot regulate certain actions that I am free to take. Um... These are two very different meanings. Roe kind of mixed them up together and said, oh, well, you know, we've got the, we all know we've got this right to privacy, so therefore abortion must be okay. Well, the right to send your children to a religious school, uh, the right to have your children receive German language instruction, do those th- things sound like they're the source of the right to kill a baby by abortion? I don't think so. But those are examples of how the court had dealt with privacy in certain cases in the past. The right not to be sterilized, okay, the right to obtain contraceptives if you're single, to do so if you're married. These were all previous Supreme Court cases that Roe kind of pointed to, but none of them involve the purposeful taking of life. And that's the thing that makes abortion, again, as we explained before, a unique act. And then, of course, you could ask, why in the world did Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey say that viability was the dividing line before which the state could not protect the baby, but after which it could, it could under certain conditions if it wanted to. It didn't have to, but it could. Why viability is the, is the dividing line? And here, here's what the court said. The compelling point is at viability. This is so because the fetus then, presumably, has the capability of meaningful life outside the womb. Well, you know what Professor Lawrence Tribe said about that uh, rationale? He said, clearly, this mistakes a definition for a syllogism. In other words, they said, viability is the dividing line between when the state can protect the baby and when it can't, because this is what viability is. In other words, 
in trying to give the rationale, it just defined viability. Well, that's when, you know, the baby can have a meaningful life outside the womb. Let's put aside for a moment the question about what is meaningful is a judgment call that people could differ about. But put that aside. Viability, but that that's the whole idea. That That's what it is. That's a definition of viability. It's not a syllogism whereby you reason to the conclusion that viability is the point at which you should draw that line. Again, this whole decision of, of, of Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey has the intellectual strength of a mosquito. It's not worth the paper it's written on, brothers and sisters. It, 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 a grade school teacher would laugh and should laugh at the kind of weak, flimsy, absolutely embarrassing attempt to make an argument that's in this document. Absol and, and, and many of those, and we'll, we'll end here, we'll, we'll go back into prayer, many of those who have supported the conclusion of Roe v. Wade, and among them, John Hart, Eli, and, and uh, even Ruth Bader Ginsburg, well, they'll support the conclusion, but they said the reasoning was really very, very weak, very, very weak, or even non-existent. We're going to continue in our next episode uh, uh, analyzing what Justice Alito said in this draft opinion. Really, really good stuff. Uh, arguing why it's time to throw Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey onto the dust heap of history. May we pray? Lord, we ask you to bless our, our, uh, our viewers tonight, bless all their needs, their families. We ask you to bless the Supreme Court justices uh, as they finalize now their work on this case, as they prepare to announce their judgment to the American people. And we ask you to bless, Lord, the American people on both sides of this issue, that we may have clear minds, open hearts, readiness to hear the court's decision and apply to it the, the reason uh, that you have blessed us with, the human reason, to apply to it, Lord, the patriotism that we have and apply to it, especially the commitment we have to defend life. Because we know, Lord God, that no matter what any court says, you yourself have given us the right to life and you alone are the Lord of life. May we always live by that creed and honor your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thanks, friends, for tuning in. Join me again tomorrow night. Connect with me on social media at FR Frank Pavone and with Right Side Broadcasting at RSB Network. Make sure you get a Getter account and a Truth Social account. And uh, go to SupremeCourtVictory.com for all the details about this case, the Dobbs case. SupremeCourtVictory.com. And thank you for watching. We will join you again tomorrow.